Katie. Uh, first of all, um, on behalf of the 34 members of the Triangle Lake community, uh, many of which are sitting in the room tonight, the 34 who have been found positive for both atrazine and 2,4-D, which would include myself, my wife, our children. We want to thank you with what I would call cautious optimism in that for seven years we tried to have this sort of study happen and were unsuccessful and finally resorted to things like holding mock trials of different Oregon government agencies and Monsanto surrounding buildings with hundreds of people and things of that nature and then finally bringing in a scientist from out of state to test us they find urine in us of the two most dangerous timber industry pesticides that gets trumpeted in the media and then all of a sudden the state agencies that wouldn't give us time of day for seven years are here and we do meet that with cautious optimism but I guess what I have to tell you and then a quick question is that we will be monitoring every step for example the lands that are offered up for the testing of the drift will want to know that those are high hillsides that are comparable to the kind of drift that happens at higher elevations. We'll want to know that the testing that happens um, happens in laboratories that can test for you know the small amounts of metabolites and such as that. So we're going to be basically watching you extremely closely, analyzing everything that you do, and if we see something that we think is bogus, we will cry foul. But we hope that you do a good job. And then uh, the question is, okay, so let's say you do the testing, and let's say the timber industry actually does some sprays, because if I was them, I wouldn't spray during the time that you're watching. <laughs> and I certainly wouldn't spray atrazine and 2,4-D while you're watching during this next year, so that's going to be a whole issue, is whether they'll even spray. But let's say they do, and let's say you find it, and we have the definitive proof it's getting into us, and let's say it appears to be through the pathway of air, through aerial drift, the really important question for the people that came here from some of those other communities and for us that live here is if that gets found out, do you change laws, do you change rules, do we get an aerial spray buffer zone? In other words, once determining what the pathway of contamination is, will you close the pathway? Mm. Oh. Oh. talk about one part of it, and okay. I think part of first we could talk about another. So, yeah, uh, there was a question earlier about if we find a problem here, what does that mean for a very similar uh, setting community somewhere else with the same practices, same application methods are being used. And that's that's why I said, yeah, we're, we're the eyes and ears of headquarters sometimes, and so are our state partners out here that we're working with. Um, if we find that there are risks that are unacceptable, we get new information after pesticides registered. That information can go back to these risk assessors back in the headquarters and in the review, re-evaluation of that label, there can be more precautions put it on, put on that label. And it's not going to say, do this for trying a lake. It'll say, you know, if you use this pesticide in this manner for this type of setting, uh, this is the precautions you have to take. So again, it's all based on the data that we're collecting and, and so that's how it can be applied more broadly. Uh, you know, application practices, forestry practices are also regulated at the state level. Level, so you have, uh, you know, the Department of Forestry um, or Forestry. I don't know how all that works. So that's a state program, and it's, it's, it's not an EPA program. But um, that is another way uh, that uh, could be applied broader than just one community. I don't know if you want to add anything. Uh, thank you. Yeah, the uh, Board of Forestry regulates pesticide use, and depending on the outcome of that, there's a process that anybody can come and say that our rules are not effective or efficient for accomplishing what they're intending to do. So there is a process for changing the rules. Um, currently, uh, we don't have full authority on regulating pesticide for moving off property. That rests with 
the EPA and the ODA. So there's a set of, of statutes and a process. What, or no, I mean, we, if we're finding drift, for instance, and we're finding drift getting into water, that is within our authority, and we will change the standards for that, and we've been changing standards over time for riparian areas, uh, for any number of things that's within our authority. Um, if it's something that's a label requirement or a, where a pesticide's allowed to use, that does lie with the EPA and ODA. So the three systems work together and the Board of Forestry would do something that's within their authority if our rules are found not to be effective. And I actually just want to add one more thing. Can I my mic still on? Uh, no. no. Uh, Greg, maybe you could um, offer up a little bit of description about the pesticide stewardship effort. Uh, so uh, one of the programs that, that we do in cooperation with a number of different agencies is called the Pesticide Stewardship Partnership Program. And uh, this is where we go into a watershed and we, and we test uh, in areas where they have heavy, steward, heavy application of pesticides, usually agricultural areas, and we test the water. And if we find pesticides, then we work in cooperation with the uh, users of those pesticides within that basin to develop a change practices to reduce the amount of pesticides that can get into the streams. In most of the cases where we've done this approach, it's been very successful in reducing the concentrations of pesticides. In most of all cases, we still detect pesticides in the streams, but at lower concentrations. And in many cases, the concentrations have dropped down below the level where they're no longer exceeding water quality criteria in those few cases where they did exceed water quality criteria. Okay. Um, I've tried to get ODF to mo monitor chemical drift without success, but I have a suggestion for the methodology. Two things to include. One is in 1980, the EPA did a study of Americans' exposure to toxic chemicals, not just by testing urine, but by testing the fat tissue, because chlorinated hydrocarbons such as atrazine and 2,4-D accumulate in the fat tissue. They don't excrete out very easily. Once in, they don't go out. So just testing urine alone may not be enough. The other is federal law dating from 1947. The Nuremberg Code says it is a violation of federal law and ethics of public health to involuntarily force people to be exposed without their consent. So if you're going to test people, great. It's decades overdue. But don't allow continued spraying of cancer-causing, birth defect-causing poison, which crosses property lines because it comes out of a helicopter with a giant rotor. Make Weyerhaeuser and the others prove that it's safe and that we have the right not to be exposed. That's the ethical thing. I'm holding a copy of Silent Spring by Rachel Carson, 1962. Almost nothing has changed since then. She died of breast cancer two years later. I've already had cancer. Fortunately, it was a minor version. But I live next to a clear cut. We had to get our whole neighbors, and it's not in Triangle Lake, it's elsewhere, to say we will test because we don't believe that the state is going to tell the timber industry to stop poisoning us. So they got some minimum wage workers to spray poisons without gloves, but they didn't helicopter spray us. So it didn't wind up in our wells. But from an ethical standpoint, federal law says we have the right not to be experimented on without our consent. I do not give the timber industry consent to spray me because they can't bother to do selective forestry, which doesn't need the herbicides anyway. Mm.